going to spend a little time in the 103rd Psalm today, and this uh, that I'm going to try to talk to you about for the next 20 or 25 minutes is a product of this morning's devotion shortly after 6. I usually know what I'm going to preach, and I did know what I was going to preach if um, nothing else uh, appeared, but um, uh, the 103rd Psalm, 103rd Psalm, to put it in context, it's a psalm written by David, and it was likely written when David was uh, rather old, because he references the experiences, and, and he, he writes of them as though they are multiple. So it's, it's not something that just happened over uh, a moment or two. It's not when he's a teenager. It's not when he's in his 20s. But this probably was written uh, not long before David uh, died. 103rd Psalm, the first, and we'll just work through it expositionally here for a moment. And uh, David begins this way, and this is called a psalm of praise. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Now, David is talking to himself. This is a personal conversation. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, if David had known a name, he would have said, bless, and he would have called the name. But David did not know that name. But he did know that it was going to be a holy or set apart or distinct name. You know something that King David didn't know. You have a name to bless. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And the second message of the New Testament church prompted Simon Peter to speak to elders and tell them, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I'm glad I know that name, but I want to do what David said. I want to bless his holy name. Praise God. And so when I read that, I read the Bible questioning because my immediate question is how can a man bless the Lord? You see, if, if you brought me fruit from your orchard, you will have blessed me. But the Lord is not going to be benefited by your plums and pears and peaches. So how do we bless the Lord? And the word literally means to come to him with a mental and emotional and spiritual posture. And it can be an actual physical posture. And what it means is to have this attitude of kneeling before the Lord. That's how you bless the Lord is to come to him either physically kneeling or you come to him with the attitude of one who is kneeling. Now David is this great instructor of how that we should praise the Lord. And in the 145th Psalm he makes this statement that just captured my imagination this morning. He said, all thy works praise thee. Pastor was talking about praise a little bit earlier. The word praise means to take action with an opened hand. It is the lifting of the hands. It is the clapping of the hands. It is the playing of stringed instruments and timbal, cymbals and drums and organs. It is praising him with our hands. And all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord. And thy saints shall bless thee. 
Lord, your works, everything that is produced by your activity, all that was ever made, the stars in the heaven, the sun and the moon, the colorful leaves that will soon be on the autumn trees, the geese I heard honking as they headed south yesterday, the bluebirds and the robins and the owls and the eagles and the Grand Canyon and the Dry Sock River and these gorgeous Ozark Mountains, all of these have resulted from your activity. And Lord, all of thy works, they praise thee. It is as though their hands are lifted and they are giving praise to God Almighty. Hallelujah. Because all of your works praise you. It's like their hands are lifted. It's like that they're clapping to the Lord because they are a praise to him. As you leave the property today, why don't you pick out a tree? Or when you get home, pick out a tree. And through the week, begin to think about all that that tree's doing. The leaves begin to fall. I saw one coming down this morning. And it was one of those that was helicoptering down to take it a long way from the tree as the wind blew. And I, I was just, it's an amazing, all of thy works, all of thy works, they bless you. Everything that is part of your activity. It is as though their hands are lifted. It is as though they are clapping their hands. And when you look at that tree through the week, please be reminded, though it has no voice with which to speak, that its hands are raised figuratively. And that the hands are clapping. And it is praising the Lord who made it in all of his works. But it says, and the saints, the saints, well, your saints, which are also part of your works, they do something different. Thy saints, they bless thee. They go beyond the figurative waving of branches and the praise of a honking goose. But instead, they come before him. Yes, they are his works, but they have been called out of darkness into light. They have been brought out of bondage bondage into deliverance. They have been set free. They know the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And they know what it is for there to be a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who never abandons you. Dark days, hallelujah, ugly times, the storms of life coming, but you not by yourself, and you won't ever be saint of God. And all of thy saints, they bless bless you. They bless you. They bless you. They bless you. Why so, David? Because, and he captures it. That second verse, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not. He's talking to himself now. Forget not. Hey, sir, don't forget the benefits of God. Don't forget, soul, his goodness to you. And so I stand aside and I say, well, David, remind me of what those benefits are. And the third verse, he says, who forgiveth all thine iniquities and who healeth all thy diseases and who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercy and who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. For everything that David mentions, there is a contrast. He forgiveth all of my iniquity. But you can be sitting here today and not be forgiven of any iniquity. There is a contrast. He healeth all of thy diseases, but there's a contrast where sickness remains. He redeemeth life, but there's a contrast where the bill is unpaid. The pawned ring is unredeemed, and nobody has claimed it. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy are there are those who are uncrowned unadorned they have no jewels of kindness and mercy in their life experience and he satisfies your mouth there is a good taste and there is plenty of it or there can be an unsatisfied mouth and an unsatisfied mouth there's too little food or it wasn't good hallelujah when you go to a bistro you're not going to Burger King you're going to leave the 
bistro hungry because they're not going to give you enough food. Your mouth is not going to be satisfied. I've had the experience more than once. I know what I'm talking about. So if you're going to order double what you usually get when you go to a bistro. Oh, but whenever we begin to talk about the Lord, He satisfies your mouth. There is a good taste of what He gives you, and there is plenty of it. I think we need to get it locked in our mind what it was that David was reminding himself that he was to bless the Lord for he forgives my iniquities. The word iniquity covers a broad expanse of human failure, a broad expanse of sin, but he forgiveth all my iniquities. David can look in his past and there had been adultery and there had been conspiracy to commit murder and there had been multiple failures in David's life, but he forgiveth all of mine iniquities. Hallelujah. And and he healeth all thy diseases. And he pays the price that I don't have to stay in jail any longer. He has redeemed me. He has paid the price that I could get out. And he crowns us with loving kindness. Think about the crown on your head if you're a saint of God. He crowns you with loving kindness. It really means that there is a great expanse of kindness that he has crowned you. He's put some. When we get to heaven, there will be crowns distributed for soul winners and martyrs and overcomers. But this is about a different kind of crown. You walk through life with a crown on your head. It is the crown of the loving kindness of God. The abundant kindness that He has displayed toward you and the compassion that you have experienced in your life. And it is for this. It is for this that David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. And just think, David didn't know his name. He knew he had one. And David had limited experience. You've had a greater expanse of experience than David ever had. You have been redeemed by the shed blood of Christ. When Cheryl goes down in that water in the name of Jesus in a few minutes, it will wash away the stain of every sin that she's ever committed in her entire life. I don't know her history. I don't know her yesterdays. I don't need to, don't want to. But I'm telling you, hallelujah, that Jesus does things in this era of time that didn't happen in David's era of time. And so David, I will bless the Lord. And in Luke 15, Jesus continues with a series of stories about God. And one of the stories is about God as the Father. And Christ said a certain man had two sons. And the younger said to his father, Father, give me. Give me my inheritance. And and his father did it, and picking up in verse 13, he took his journey to a far country, and he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want. He went, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and, and that citizen of the far country sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would feign, or he would, of necessity, fill his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, the phrase came to himself means when he came to his right mind, when he got his head on straight, he came to himself. 
He is in a place of want. He is in physical poverty. He is without. He is destitute. And no man gave unto him. Listen. There is a disease of spiritual, mental, and emotional poverty that you can live in when your pockets are filled with cash and your bank account is flush. But there is still a poverty of soul. And the far country and the riotous living and living among the hogs and taking care of them will quickly leave you sick. Sick in your soul, sick in your spirit, sick in your emotions, and sick in your mind. And that man in that condition, the poverty of life, he said to himself, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran fell on his neck and kissed him. The story is about God the Father. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. And that's the last we hear from the son. He never utters another word in the story that Jesus told about the father. Because from that point forward, he makes it very plain that this story is not about the son. It's not about the child. It's not about the derelict. It's not about the one who is in poverty of mind, but this is about a father ignoring his son's request for a job and instead restoring this child to a position. He wasn't going to live in the house with the hired hands, he's going to live back in his bedroom. He's going to move quickly from poverty and the swine herd to sonship because that's the will of the Father, that he be forgiven. <laughs> He's not going to get up every morning with Dad having an account book. But instead, he's going to get up every morning and he's going to put shoes on his feet. Hallelujah. He's going to grab that robe that's laying by the nightstand and he's going to put that on. And, and uh, he's going to put that ring on that, that was a key that helped him get in the house. Somebody asks, he's going to say, I belong here. Oh, but didn't you take all that you were given and waste it? Didn't you come home with the smell of the swine upon you? That's immaterial. To the reality of this moment. And all that is going forward. What you have been and what you spent. And what you wasted in riotous living. Is inconsequential to what your today. And to what your tomorrow is going to be for God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And dad said to his servants. Bring the best robe. And put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And I want you to imagine the story having a different end. Let's rewrite history for a moment. The son comes with that statement, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. And the dad looks at him and says, That's exactly right, bud. And with harsh, hard eyes, he says, how dare you come back around here? You have a lot of guts, boy, showing up at this house. Where you been all this time? And I can tell it hadn't gone well. You stink. Why don't you just keep a rolling? 
And wherever you came from, you get right on back there. Hallelujah. But that's not the way Jesus wants you to see him. Instead, there is a redeeming of that son from the potential destruction if he went back to the swine herd and went back to the farmer. Instead, he's going to have a robe on his shoulders and he's going to have a ring on his fingers and he's going to have shoes on his feet. Hallelujah. And dad is going to give him every reason to understand that this is where I belong. Somebody needs to listen to me. You got something whispering in your ear just now. And it's been there for several days. I don't have any right. I don't belong. What am I doing even thinking about giving my life over to Christ? What am I thinking about dedicating myself to him? I've wasted so much of my life. I've wasted gifts and talents and a wasted ability. But could you hear it from this preacher who does not know your story? Could you hear it today that all of that does not matter? He wants you to be come not just a not just a servant not just an occasional visitor not just somebody that shows up at Christmas time he wants you to be a son in the father's house you say but I'm not churchy like all these folks I know some of them they smell they stunk Some were filthy with perverseness of life. There was ugliness of soul. If you can know their stories, if you can listen to what's taken place in their lives, I can assure you that you would feel like that you belong here because they've been right where you've been and they've gone right through what you're going through. And the Father has said, you belong here. You belong here. You belong here. You belong here. here." And bring here the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. The fatted calf became food for the mouth. Good food and plenty of it. A belly that had once been empty and later filled with the husk that the swine ate regularly. That belly is now filled with a fatted calf. Husks that were only fit for hogs and for starving wanderers to eat is no longer the boy's reality. And why does dad say to his servants do this? Because my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And starting out in the middle of a thoroughfare on the way to the father's house, they began to be merry. Didn't wait on the band to show up. They began to be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. From the time that boy said, I'm not worthy to be your son. The father took over. And dad commanded the servants. They brought what was required. And then they headed back home. And as you make that journey, and he walks with me and he talks with me me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we carry there none other has ever The story is told from the father's perspective. But if you look at it from the son's perspective, he joins David. He's now having gone through life experience. 
There's somebody in the room that's come from that same place today. And you can join the son and you can join David. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I bow before his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and I will not forget your benefits. You've forgiven all of my iniquities, and you've healed my mental and emotional and spiritual and physical diseases. And you have paid the price redeeming my life from destruction. And you crown me with loving kindness and tender mercy. And you have satisfied my mouth with good things. I've been forgiven. I've been healed. I've been redeemed. I've been crowned and I've been satisfied. That's David's testimony. It's the testimony of many we're in this room just now. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us, and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.